Good evening. Uh, I'm Mike Perry, the Executive Director of the Army Heritage Center Foundation, and I welcome you back after the, uh, the holiday period. Hope everybody had a good holiday season uh, and glad that you're rejoining our lecture program tonight. Um, tonight, we're, I'm pleased to have uh, Colonel Retired Greg Fontenot. Uh, Greg was an armor officer. Uh, he commanded an armor battalion uh, during Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and then a brigade uh, in Bosnia during our uh, involvement in trying to end the Bosnian Wars. Uh, afterwards, uh, he held uh, a position as the director of the School of Advanced Military Studies or the SAMS program at the Command and General Staff College. Uh, today, he serves as both a consultant uh, and also as a, uh, a historian. So uh, he's written uh, two books, one that looks at the uh, First Infantry Division and the other one looks at the early history of OIF and OEF. Uh, tonight, he's gonna to talk about a new work he's working, he just completed, that looks at uh, the training of armored divisions or how some of the units prepared uh, during combat in World War II. And so now, Greg, the, the, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mike. Uh, the book I'm working on now, though, for those of, uh, since you mentioned it, is on the first entry division. And I'm looking at uh, how to maintain tactical excellence in the uh, face of high casualties, which the 1st Infantry Division certainly experienced, losing 206% uh, of their force, killed, wounded, or uh, now in battle injuries or disease between June 6, 1944 and May 1945. I'd like to begin by uh, pro uh, giving you a quotation from uh, Charles B. MacDonald's book, uh, The Green Book, The Siegfried Line Campaign. MacDonald wrote in his preface that it is always in, an enriching experience to write about the American soldier in adversity, no less than in glittering triumph. Glitter and dash, he went on to say, were conspicuously absent in most of the Siegfried Line campaign. I am interested in the dystopian life of soldiers in tanks and foxholes and the institution that prepared them or failed to prepare them, depending on your point of view. And I want to talk tonight about a, a draft A division, the 7th Armored Division in the Battle of the Bulge uh, from the book that I wrote called Loss and Redemption, Sam Beef. Mike, may I have the next chart, sir? So the question is, it's now 76 years. Uh, January the 5th, 1945, the 7th Armored Division was in reserve in the 18th Corps, uh, refitting, retraining, and focusing on organizing and training at the uh, company team level. Uh, Major General Hasbrook organized every one of his companies, both rifle companies and tank companies, his combined arms teams with uh, two tanks and a mechanized infantry uh, platoon or two mechanized infantry and a tank platoon. And each of these units had a, uh, an engineer platoon attached. Uh, why is this battle of the bulge still important? Well, I think these three bullets say it. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about strategic choices. And I also believe that old dead Carl, Carl von Clausewitz, the uh, Prussian, his, uh, Prussian uh, theorist, uh, still matters. Uh, if you read uh, Clausewitz today and you read it critically, you'll find that in fact, everything about uh, we, what we do today was largely being done in the, uh, in the 19th century. I would also argue that every intelligence system that we have today was present on the battlefield in World War II. Most of them present on the battlefield in World War I. The exceptions are cyber uh, and uh, cyber meaning computer hacking and satellite intelligence. But we had overhead imagery as far back as World War I and the first SIGINT exploitation that led to a tactical success or operational success in this case was at Tannenberg in 1914. Uh, the chief protagonist here, uh, we're going to talk about are the 106th Infantry Division, the 7th Armed Division on one side, the 6th Panzer Army, and the 5th Panzer Army on the other, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. May I have the next chart, please, Mike? Uh, so what is it I tried to do in this book? What are we going to try to do tonight? We're going to talk a little bit about the things that you see there. Terrain and weather matter. You know, uh, it's a perfect night for us to talk about uh, the Battle of the Bulge. It's cold and, and snowy uh, here in Kansas, 17 degrees. Temperature got up as high as 19 today. Uh, I, I think it's cold and snowy from what Mike told me in Pennsylvania. Some of you are probably in places that are warm, but if you've ever been in the field as a soldier, there's nothing colder than being on a tank or a half track in World War II, or worse still in a, in a foxhole with your feet wet. 
and that matters. Uh, I want to talk about leadership. And finally, I want to pick up on the theme that Hasso von Manteuffel, the commander of the Fifth Army, I had to say, he said that the kind of life of the small people, the junior leaders are central to the story. And that applied on both sides. The GIs, it's government, uh, uh, the, the GIs, the infantry call themselves GIs or does or doughboys. And they call themselves doggies. When I was in the army, doggy was a pejorative, but not World War II. So we're going to talk about the doggies and what they had to do. Next chart, please. This is the context. In 1943 in November, virtually in the same week, there were a series of conferences from the Allies, first in, uh, in uh, Tehran, I may have it backwards, then in Cairo. But at the same time, uh, Adolf Hitler issued Führerbefehl einen uh, Fünfzig, which is a Führer order, or leader, war leader's order 51. And he shifted the main effort from the east to the west. And he argued that they had uh, operational uh, depth in the east, but not in the west. And so he needed to shift efforts. So in November of 43, he decided to focus on fighting in the west. At the same time in November 43, Tehran with Joe Stalin and in Cairo, with Chiang, Chiang Kai-shek and others, the allies settled on, hey, we're really gonna do this. We're gonna invade 1944. The second thing is the allies uh, broke out at Salo uh, with uh, great success, uh, devastated the Germans, pursued them to the Siegfried line and then ran out of fuel. In the words of uh, fuel and ammunition both, in the, in the words of, uh, of Klausowitz, they culminated uh, right at the Siegfried line, which had been run down, but was, was re repaired to some extent, remanned, uh, great fighting uh, occurred as a consequence, bitter, uh, horrible fighting, in fact. And the third bullet, I'll let you read for yourself. Uh, bottom line is both sides ran out of manpower. The United States Army made operational and strategic decisions to man the Air Force first and all the specialty branches, including things like the airborne, uh, air, anti-aircraft artillery, everybody got priority except for the infantry. And so the smartest guys that we had in the force were in, in the Army Air Force, and then the paratroops. And so the infantry that did the fighting were the, uh, what was left. And that included people like uh, Audie Murphy, too small to get in the Navy or the Marine Corps, but just big enough to carry a rifle in the third infantry division. One of my favorite characters I'm writing about now is a man named Mominy, who's five feet one inches tall. He was too small to uh, carry a rifle until uh, Omaha Beach in 1944, where with a bayonet, his rifle was 40 inches, 48 inches long, whereas he was only 61 inches long. We were running out of manpower, which is why we had soldiers of the quality of Eddie Slovak, who was the only soldier executed for desertion. Slovak was 4F until 44 because he was a thug, and we know what happened to him. The last bullet says a lot about uh, soldiers and uh, institutional thinkers and policymakers today bias, uh, particularly confirmation bias, and assumptions that the other people think just like you, and it turns out that's not true. Next chart, sir. This is a quick timeline on the 7th Armed Division. We organized 89 Army divisions in World War II, and we deployed all 89 of them. At, 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 by the time of the summer of 1945, there were 89 Army divisions, and there were six Marine divisions. All 95 were overseas. There wasn't a single division left in the United States. The original victory plan anticipated and estimated we would need 200 divisions to fight World War II. In the end, we mobilized and, and uh, trained uh, roughly the same number of troops that it would take to man 200, but they were uh, misplaced in some instances. We had about 150,000 soldiers, in fact, in a program called the Army Specialty uh, Training Program, Specialized Training Program, which were, they were sent to colleges, you know, University of North Carolina, Harvard, Yale, anywhere, uh, anywhere but in the infantry, in order not to have uh, a lost generation. That was an initiative of Secretary Stimson, and that remained in effect until 1944, when we literally were running out of soldiers. Well, why is that, you say? Well, partly it was because of the, or not partly, mostly it was because of the fact that we had to maintain this uh, adequate strength to, uh, to be the arsenal of democracy and to man, uh, rather to uh, produce the uh, material required for people like the Soviet Union. 
I'll, I'll let you look at the timeline for a second. I'd only say that the Seventh Arm Division, as soon as it got off the boats in August of 44, it was immediately put into combat. They had not unloaded all the boats when the first battalions of the Seventh Arm Division were in a contact uh, combat fight uh, 90 miles east of uh, Omaha and Utah Beach. We'll talk a little bit more about the bulge here in a second. They fought across Germany and reached the Baltic Sea in May of 1945. Next chart, please, Mike. I wanna mention the forest complex of the Hürtgen, Ardennes, and Eiffel. The Ardennes and Eiffel are all gro old growth forest, about 70, 80 miles in depth. And you can see shaped largely like an isosceles triangle. Uh, extending uh, Belgium, the edge of France, uh, Luxembourg, and into Germany. In Germany, it's called the Eiffel, and uh, the Schnee Eiffel to be precise. That literally means snow plateau. All of this ground is ancient volcanic uh, ground. So it's uh, uh, a lot of rivers rise out of the uh, Ardennes, the Eiffel, and the Hürtgen, including the Ruhr River, the Ur River, the Erft River. So the forest is densely forested and cut with ravines and streams and really difficult to move around. The Hürtgen, on the other hand, is a combination of old growth, but forest planted allegedly by the general staff of, uh, of, of the German empire as an obstacle to continue the obstacle. Everybody knows you can't get through the Schnee Eiffel, so the Germans went through it three different times. In fact, in 1944, just before the, the bulge happened, an Air Force officer was in, in the town of saint Vith looking for soda. There was a soda plant, you know, made orange drink, a carbonated orange drink. And he, uh, all the people were leaving. And the Army Air Force officer asked the local, well, why is that? And, it, and the response was, well, the Bosch always come through the Ardennes. But in 1944, the general staff of the, of the U.S. Army and, and also the Allied armies thought the Ardennes were, quote, impenetrable. Next chart. This picture that's coming up shows why they thought it was impenetrable. This is, uh, these are uh, two uh, Stuart tanks from the East 7th uh, Armored Reconnaissance Squadron of the 7th Armored Division in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the forest. And you can see the firebreaker trail through the woods is, uh, isn't much. And you can see how close the trees are together. In the Hurtgen, they're even closer. The average distance between trees and the Ardennes was three to five feet. They were more tightly uh, forested in the, uh, in the Eiffel. And the next chart, please, Mike. This is showing some open terrain, a hay field on one side uh, of a little valley, looking at a ridge called the Prümerberg. And if you've read, if you happen to have read Loss and Redemption, the Prümerberg was a north-south ridge, densely forested located just east of the town of San Diego. Now the next chart I'm gonna bring up, or Mike is gonna bring up, shows the planned uh, armor routes through the, uh, through the Ardennes. Uh, for those of you that read German, Vague Schizze, Tile Eins is the root sketch, uh, root sketch, page one or sheet one. Panzerverbande is the uh, Panzer route or tank route. And then it's got various things like the top left one says Durchgangstrasse, that's a street that'll go through. And if you look at the red line, that's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven down on the left side there, it says Schwerger Wegstrecke. Uh, it is a, a no-go route. So if you look at these routes, there were five of them, north to south, A, B, C, D, E. Uh, you can see most of route A is red, pretty hard to get through. And all of them have problems. So. It is true that in, in a large way that the, uh, uh, the Ardennes is tough to get through. In the upper left, you see a place that says Hoes Fen. That's the high fens or upland marsh based on the volcanic earth. These were soft ground. And so this was pretty hard going. You can see all the forested regions. The beige colors is a Hoachgelande, Uber, 550 meters, and my German pronunciation is horrible. That is uh, high ground above, uh, uh, right at 2,000 feet in, in height. The other thing I draw your attention to is names matter in, in uh, the Ardennes, and it's particularly in German. So any place that ends in a Bach, like Butgenbach, 
the Bach means stream. And there are a lot of places where there's a Harris Bach, Butgen Bach, and a lot of them. If it says Scheid, S-C-H-E-I-D, it means ravine. And you can see motor shied, head shied, and a bunch of shides. If it says feld on the end, it's a field, pasture, or, or places that you could grow things, and so forth. So the names of the places tell you a lot. Next chart, please, sir. I know I'm going through this quickly, so I hope you'll bear with me. And here's uh, some basic things about how the Army thought. In the interwar period, largely thanks to the really good piece of legislation called the National Defense Act of 1921, I believe it was, might have been 1920, I might have it wrong. We, uh, we organized the Army in such a way as to have uh, nine core areas, and each core area would have a regular Army division. So there were nine regular Army divisions, two National Guard divisions, therefore there were 18 of them, and three Army of the United States or Reserve divisions. So that gave you the the immediate capability to expand to 54 divisions. And, and there were some other things about it, but, the, but that legislation provided for things like an independent air service that was uh, our air corps that was designed to become an independent air force ultimately. We also uh, redesigned our artillery and I won't go into detail on that, but anybody that's interested, I'll give you my email address at the end and I can provide you some information on it. And by the end of 1944, we had, as you can see, air supremacy. I mentioned we had 89 divisions, 22 of which to the Pacific. You wouldn't know that from reading the history of World War II, so I'd, I'd attract your attention to uh, uh, a historian named McManus, John McManus, who's in the second, has just published the second of three books on the U.S. Army in the Pacific. And trust me, the U.S. Army you know, carried at least its share of the load in the Pacific. I mentioned the manpower shortage. The German army, on the other hand, they thought of uh, Bewegungskrieg, a war of movement. Their, their whole idea was you won war by mobility. Interestingly though, by 1944, uh, a German infantry division had 2,100 vehicles, a US army infantry division had 2,000. The difference was all 2,000 of the US armies were motorized vehicles. About 14 or 1,500 of the German vehicles were horse-drawn. Manpower shortage in both armies led to reduced structure. The U.S. Army divisions reduced several times through the war. In 1943, both the Army and the U.S. Army and the German Army reduced their divisions yet again. Uh, the U.S. Army to about 11,000, a little more than 11,000. The German Army to uh, about 10,000. And there were two armies in Germany, the regular forces and the Waffen SS. And I'll let you read all that business about Auftrag's tactique versus Selbstständigkeit. The U.S. Army uh, really bought into the notion that Auftrag's tactique was somehow some, you know, amazing new idea. It isn't really. And if you look at the 1944 uh, and 1941 field service regulations for the U.S. Army, you know, we are uh, mission orders uh, just as much as the Germans do. Next chart. Very quickly, I'll let you read these. A couple of myths. Uh, U.S. tanks arguably were inferior in certain ways. In other ways, they were far superior to German tanks. They were far better uh, mechanically and their readiness rates were far higher. Uh, they were better built. They weren't over-engineered. Uh, they, they lasted quite well. But we built a tank designed to exploit the benefit of infantry penetration. So we built a tank with a low velocity 75 millimeter round, whereas the Germans built high velocity main guns. Our tanks were designed to blow up bunkers and shoot up command posts. Their tanks were designed to kill tanks. We built tank destroyers for that. So we had a, a bit of a problem in terms of tank v tank, but if you use tanks properly and tank destroyers properly, the U.S. Army uh, did quite well. Uh, German infantry uh, because they had reduced the size of their divisions, they increased the size of automatic weapons. They had a great many more automatic weapons in a German infantry division than we did. Uh, one of the great myths of history is the notion of continuous front lines. That happened in World War I, where arguably you could walk in, uh, get in a trench on the uh, coast of Belgium and come out on the, uh, the edge of the French Alps without ever being above ground. That certainly was not the case in World War II. We never had secure air areas. We did not have continuous front lines. 
and I'll I'll rest my case there. I want to show you a couple of charts on how units were organized very quickly. The German, uh, the U.S. Army Armored Division, we built 20 of them. Three of them were originally built as heavy divisions. That is, they had a tank regiment and, uh, and two empty or two tank regiments, two empty regiments. But we reorganized those to reduce the size of them because <coughs> we just couldn't man them. <coughs> so you had, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> six battalions in the 7th Armored Division on the right hand side of the chart. You see three tank battalions, three armored empty battalions. Then there were three artillery battalions. All of these were self propelled 105s. Then in the bottom right, you see combat support formations, the 87th Reconnaissance Squadron, <coughs> organic to the first uh, to the 7th Armored Division, and then the 814th Tank Destroyer uh, Battalion, most of which were manned with M10 uh, tank destroyers, so they had some M18s later. The, M uh, the M10s were 76 millimeter uh, tank guns, any tank guns, and the uh, M18s had 90 millimeter, and they were really devastated German tanks and the third, 203rd anti-aircraft artillery. Uh, the next chart shows the organization of 106th Infantry Division, organized very much like every other infantry division, uh, all other 89, three infantry regiments, each of which had uh, three infantry battalions. Each uh, battalion had three rifle companies, as well as a, uh, uh, a weapons company, and each regiment had a cannon company. The division artillery of an infantry division had three 105 battalions, and as you see, one 155 battalion. On the far right, you see a uh, wheeled uh, reconnaissance troop. Each infantry division had a recon troop. Next chart, please. This is a typical regular army, regular German army Panzer Division, 116th in this case. Six battalions, two tank battalions, four infantry battalions. The four infantry battalions are all intended to be motorized. In most cases, even in 44, they were motorized either on a half track or some kind of truck. Uh, the, the two tank battalions, one had the Panther tank, which was the Com Panzer Kampfwagen Mark V, a really good tank, uh, high velocity uh, 75, and Panzer Kampfwagen IV, which had a, uh, a 75 also. And you see that they had com very combat support. Uh, next chart, please. This is the Volksgrenadier Division. This is the redesigned, smaller uh, infantry division of 1944. Three infantry regiments, each with uh, two battalions. You see their artillery. The Fusilier Battalion was a light infantry battalion, uh, vehicle mounted, or rather bicycle mounted. And the Hetzer was uh, an anti-tank gun on a track. Uh, Czech Republic, or they're rather Czechoslovakian made, and you see they had uh, various combat support. Next chart. So after the United States and, uh, and, and the Commonwealth uh, units broke out uh, at Saint-Lô, essentially, we ran across uh, France all the way to the Siegfried Line. On the 7th of September of 44, von Rundstedt reported uh, that, that he only had 100 tanks remaining of the 1,500 he had to begin with. Yet somehow the Germans managed to get back to the Siegfried line with their headquarters intact, even though their units had absolutely been devastated. And you can see uh, the rest of the bullets. And Omar Bradley wrote in his memoir that Germans had shown an astonishing capacity for recuperation. He wrote that about the Germans in the summer of 44, about their capacity to, to rebuild a fight in fall, late summer, early fall of 44. But it was true again in December. Next chart, please. This is a, a, a calligraphy uh, developed map uh, done for a personal experience monograph at the infantry school after World War II. These, the Army had all these guys coming back from the war and they had calligraphers they drafted. So you wrote a paper about your experience and then a calligrapher, an Army calligrapher would illustrate it for you. This is one of those. It shows uh, we had about 55 divisions on the ground, allied divisions. You could see the Canadian First Army in the north, the British second, and so forth down the line. There were three army groups, uh, the 21st Army Group in the north, the US 12th Army Group in the center, and the, the 6th Army Group in the south with 7th US Army and the French First Army. That's just to give you some context. So it's a big, big operation about the same number of German divisions opposite. So we were about, about even in strength, believe it or not. Next chart. 
this chart, uh, ladies and gentlemen, shows the uh, situation at the outset uh, of the operation. The Germans attacked on the 16th. This shows the situation as of 18 December. And you can see the Germans going around the Schnee Eiffel largely. Uh, Sixth Panzer Army was supposed to you know, more or less stay north of, of the Schnee Eiffel, but the roads weren't very good. So they, they kind of went wherever they wanted to. Most of the Sixth Army units, Sixth Army was led by an SS general named Sepp Dietrich. And SS units tended to do whatever the hell they felt like doing. They weren't too good about following orders from, from others. But this shows the general axes of advance of both the 6th, 5th, 6th and 5th Panzer Armies and the 7th Army, about 28 German divisions, uh, roughly uh, 300,000 troops, uh, going against uh, uh, five U.S. divisions, three of which had been beaten up in the, uh, uh, in the Hurtgen Forest and were back in, the, uh, uh, in an economy of force role. Uh, the 106th Division was a brand new division that arrived on the 10th. And the 106th is a special story. The U.S. Army built its divisions uh, by assembling a division command group and then bringing the troops in ex post facto and then taking them up through division level training. Well, this 106th went all through that. And then it was, quote, cadreed and lost half of its troops in the end of September of 1944, and they were sent to higher priority units that were being deployed to Europe. And, and by the way, as an aside, the last infantry division was activated in 1943. So we, had, we were out of Schlitz in 44 and looking for how we were gonna man these units. And that included shutting down the Army Specialized Training Program I mentioned earlier. So the 106 had completed all of its training up through division level, and then lost slightly more than half its strength. The strength was rebuilt and they were moved to the ports of embarkation at the end of November, sent overseas, uh, spent three days bouncing around in the channel, seasick as hell, went ashore in La Harve on the 10th, spent the first night in about two inches of water in an open field with no tentage, and then put in the back of Deuce and a half and shuttled across to uh, the Schnee Eiffel where they were then uh, detrucked, as they said in those days, climbed up into the mountains of the Schnee Eiffel during the snow, which uh, one soldier said of the 106th that as far as he could understand, Schnee Eiffel meant one hell of a lot of snow. They got into the, into the area, they replaced the 2nd Infantry Division, which had been worn down, uh, you know, fighting since the uh, D plus seven, and went into uh, positions exactly, they did a relief in place, which meant they literally took over the machine guns and howitzers of the, of the second infantry division. The second infantry division got the new equipment that they brought and they went up to the north allegedly to rest, didn't last long as you might guess. The 106 as it went in made a lot of mistakes. They were very cold on arrival. They were tired because they hadn't had a chance to dry out even. And they spent several days focusing on uh, getting warm and dry. And rule number one in a combat situation is you do what's going to kill you first, and then you do the things that'll kill you later second, which is, you know, build log huts and warm yourselves ex after you've built, after you've uh, provided for your defense. They didn't do very well on that. They made a very little effort to do patrolling. Uh, the morning after the 106th arrived, uh, a couple of soldiers in one of the regiments uh, woke up, and the next morning they discovered chalked on the side of their of the hut that the uh, Second Infantry Division had left them it was a note from the Germans that said "Welcome to the Schnee Eiffel," which tells you these guys' security wasn't wasn't great. All of that aside, uh, they had a, a tough row to hoe, and over the next five or six days after arriving on the 10th, uh, they they didn't do as many of the things as they should have done. Uh, but in fairness to them, they really never had a fighting chance. They were told that there was nothing to worry about. This was a rest area. Charles McDonald that I cited earlier, who also wrote uh, as a, a book called Company Commander because he was in the Schnee Eiffel, uh, described the, uh, that sector as a combination nursery and old folks home. It's where new units went to learn uh, what it was like to be in a combat zone and beat up units went to rest. Next chart, please. On the 16th, they just almost got overrun. The 7th Armored Division was ordered out of 9th Army area 
to head south to uh, Savif. That's the routes that they took. Uh, this is from an overlay and I'll let you look at it. The, the, the most important thing to note here is if you look at the east route on the right hand side below documental reference, all the soft stuff, division tactical command post, reserve command, all that stuff is on the east route and they were all moving administratively because nobody understood what had happened. That is the Germans had broken through. If you see Malmody down there, Malmody is the town through which the first SS Panzer Division went and, uh, and slaughtered uh, soldiers. A lot of you will have seen pictures of uh, uh, half tracks and tanks burning on a road in, in San Vith film that the Germans took. That happened at a little, uh, on a highway between the towns of Recht and Poteau, which you see at the very bottom. Next chart, please. Now remember, we talked about continuous front lines earlier. This is an overlay of the situation on the 17th of December. You see the two regiments, the 422nd and the 423rd, are already isolated, they're cut off. Combat Command B of the 9th Armored Division, led by a man named Bill Hogue, is uh, at the Winter Spelt, and the, the rest of the 106th uh, is deployed, as you see, with the 424th west of the town of Winter Spelt and the command post in Savith. And they are already in deep trouble, is the point. Next chart. And again, this is to show you that there is no continuous front line. Uh, if this looks clear to anybody, it's, uh, it's only because, um, well, it shouldn't look clear to anyone is my point. You have Germans attacking north, east, from the north, the east, the south, and Germans as far back as La Roche, which is all the way back on the western side of the, uh, of the overlay where it says Samre. And you can see the situation is confusing. And I want you to remember that in 1944, the way a division commander saw the battlefield was with his ears and his eyes. Ears, uh, reports, eyes by reading reports or physically going out to see for himself. At this point, the, the, the Seventh Armored Division and the survivors of the 106th are being attacked by the First SS Division up in the far north. Uh, the, the, the division symbol says GD is actually the uh, Fuhrer Escort Brigade, the 18th Volksgrenadiers next, the 62nd Volksgrenadier Division, the 116th Panzer Division, the 2nd Panzer Division, the 560th Volksgrenadier Division. And everybody but a partridge in a pear tree is in the attack. It's a, it's a bad time all around. May I have the next chart, please? Again, this shows the continuing uh, uh, the, the situation getting worse and worse. They are uh, increasingly uh, cut off. Now you have, though, the appearance of the 18th Airborne Corps with the 82nd Airborne coming in to the rear of Savith. And units from the 3rd Armored Division are coming in now. If you look to the far left of the chart, you see Task Force Hogan, Task Force Kane, and Task Force Orr. Those are each uh, battalion, uh, two battalions grouped together, combined arms task forces out of the 3rd Armored Division, one of the heavy divisions. So it had two tank regiments and an empty regiment and about 300 tanks authorized. So big outfit. Um, I'm going to... Uh, slow the pace down here uh, and get uh, get to the point where we can stop looking at charts and maybe answer some questions. Next chart gets us to the uh, the depth of the penetration. The blue line is the U.S. defensive positions and the red units that you see are those the German units. And this is uh, from the 18th of December through the 2nd of January. You see Boston isolated in the center, San Vith holding out a little peninsula there in the north center of the, uh, of the chart. Uh, next chart, please. Uh, I'm gonna blow past that. That just tells you how many units were in contact uh, over, the, over time. I wanna just say a second here, after the Seventh Army Division was forced out of San Vith, <coughs> they went back to a place called Barak de Fretour which is the little uh, crossroads you see at the lower right-hand side. Uh, <coughs> that was defended by a pickup group of uh, units from the 106th Division and people that happened to drive by. And the 7th Armored Division came into the north of them. On the 
on the night of, uh, of uh, Christmas Eve, the 7th Army Division was ordered to withdraw to the north. This is a map from the 2nd SS Panzer Division, a German uh, SS unit. And at the same time, at 1030 at night on the 24th, the 40th Tank Battalion, which was in position here, was ordered to withdraw to the town of Monhey. At the very same time, the 2nd SS began its attack to the north on Highway N15 that you see running up towards Monhey. And interestingly enough, uh, Panzer 401 from the tank regiment of the 2nd SS, commanded by a man named Barkman, got intermingled with a battalion, uh, the 40th Tank Battalion. And you can see that uh, he went all the way up through Manhei, uh, killed a bunch of Americans. 40 tanks of the, uh, of, of the 7th Army Division were destroyed that night, basically destroyed the, uh, the 40th uh, Tank Battalion. Old Barkman managed to get back. So Panzer 401, a Panther tank, managed to survive all that by merely by turning around in the dark and, and heading back south. Uh, a couple more charts to go through, and then, then I'd like to take some questions and answers or, or criticisms. Next chart, please, Mike. This shows the losses uh, that happened. Uh, I said Christmas Eve, it was the 23rd. They did a counterattack on Christmas Eve to try to retake Monhey. They were too weak to make it happen. They had 180 tanks uh, authorized. They lost 110 of them. Um, and you see what else, or else they lost. Lost about half of their infantry strength. And you can see it, B Troop of the 87th Cavalry emerged with a loss of, with only 36 of 135. The officer that took command of B Troop to get it reconstituted was a man named Lieutenant William B. Knowlton. Uh, Knowlton went AWOL from the hospital to get back into the fight. Uh, later on was superintendent of the United States Military Academy, retired as a three-star. Uh, there are a lot of brave men in that outfit. I want to talk just a second about reconstitution on the next chart, please. They rebuilt that division uh, in almost no time. On uh, Christmas Eve, they were had 8,921 assigned out of not quite 12,000. And you can see that the U Army managed to replace them pretty much entirely by the 8th of January. They published training schedules in the 7th Army Division. Robert W. Hasbrook, whom I had the opportunity to interview some 45 years ago, maybe even longer now, um, focused his training on company-sized teams that, as I mentioned earlier, had tanks, infantry, and engineers in them. And they did some of the things that you saw to prepare to fight in the snow. The last chart I'm going to show you is the route they took to get back to St. Heath and retake it. Next chart. And I'll just uh, let you look at that. Uh, I'll let you read the book if you want to know how they got back there. But the 7th Army Division retook St. Heath about a month after it lost in the first place. But it couldn't have achieved the redemption of retaking St. Vith without the attachment of the 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment from uh, the 82nd Airborne and the 517th uh, Independent Regimental Combat Team, which later then I think joined the, either the 13th or 17th Airborne. Uh, some really great soldiers were in those units. The 517th uh, uh, Mel Zace commanded a battalion in that outfit. and. Uh, Dick Seitz commanded a battalion in that outfit. And Dave Grange, uh, there are two Dave Granges, a retired two-star and a retired three-star. The three-star Dave Grange was a radio uh, telephone operator for Dick Seitz Infantry Battalion in 1944. So these were, these were pretty salty units. The point of, the, of going through this as quickly as I did, just to give you an overview, and I hope it'll uh, encourage you to follow up and maybe read the book and or uh, read other books associated with it. I would urge everybody to read Hugh Cole's the, uh, official history. It's called The Ardennes, The Battle of the Bulge. And I would also urge you to consider reading Charles B. McDonald's book, The Summons of the Trumpet, as well as Greg Fontenot's book, Lost and Redemption at saint -Vith. Mike, that's all I have to say. I'm looking forward, I, I hope, to some uh, criticism and or questions. Over. It always helps to unmute yourself. Uh, first question is from Barry, and he's asking, uh, could you comment on Belton Cooper's book on the Third Armored Division, Death Traps? Belton Cooper's book is a brilliant book. 
uh, Belton Cooper uh, points out for anyone, uh, points out among other things, the limitations of the Sherman tank. And to understand the Sherman, I spent some time in one. And one of the things interesting to me about the Sherman tank, when you think about uh, people talking about how technology has made life more complex, that is antith antithetical to the way I think. I think technology makes things easier. We might make them more complex, but the technology solves problems. In the Sherman tank, you had a 10 power telescope that had no ballistic reticle. That meant there was no way to squeeze a, a target in or do any kind of range estimation with it, with the reticles. There was nothing in there that would do that for you. So they were taught to compute range by the thing called the worm formula. The width of the target is equal to the range range over uh, mills. And so you were supposed to know the width of the, uh, the target you looked at, translate that into mills seen in your reticle, and then do some math while under fire. So if you've seen the movie Fury, the way you solve that problem is you don't try to do any math under fire. Hell, I can't do math when I'm not being shot at. What you do is you shoot a smoke round and adjust from there. So I don't know if that answers your question, Barry, but uh, Belton Cooper's book is a great book, uh, well worth the time to read. I would also tell you that um, Dan Bulger's recent book called uh, Panzer Killers, I think it is, about the Third Armored Division, is an equally good book, as is, uh, I can't think of the name of it, it's called Spearhead by Adam Makos. It's another good book about uh, serving as a tank, uh, tank crewman in World War II. Over. Okay. Next question comes from Ed. He would like you to comment about Bruce Clark. Uh, I interviewed Bruce Clark several times, and I became a correspondent of his. Uh, Bruce Clark was a hell of a good soldier. He, uh, he, he was, in Bill Hogue's opinion, a great fighter. And I want to mention something about Bill Hogue here in a second. Clark, uh, however, in my view, uh, took, took on credit for the fighting at San Vith that was properly Robert W. Hasbrook's. Chester Wilmot, an Australian uh, journalist who wrote the first uh, big history of World War II, published in 47, rightly described Hasbrook as one of the great men of World War II. I didn't spend enough time talking about Hasbrook, and I spent no time talking about some of the soldiers, and I promised I would. One of my favorite soldiers uh, graduated from uh, Yale in 1943 with honors, decided to enlist rather than wait to be drafted, and was a staff sergeant by the end of the war, section sergeant of an 81 millimeter mortar platoon. <coughs> and that guy knew armor doctrine in World War II as well as anybody. <coughs> he wrote a book, <coughs> excuse, excuse me, that's in the uh, Army Heritage and Education Center called Grinding It Through with the 7th Armor Division. Someday, that's another book, Mike, I want to edit and get published because this guy's story is incredible. I've lost track of what, what the question was now because I wandered off. But uh, I wanted to know about Bruce Clark. Bruce Clark was a great soldier, uh, as was Bill Hogue. A quick thing about Bill Hogue, Bill Hogue was an engineer who, as was Bruce Clark, these were combat engineers, not tankers. And both of them uh, became great, brilliant armor officers. Uh, Clark, uh, rather uh, Hogue, uh, organized Combat Command A of the 9th Armor Division. Then he was called to, to uh, Alaska to help build the Alcan Highway, went back to the 9th Armored Division. They pulled him out again, and he commanded a special engineer brigade that did uh, barrier clearance and mine clearance on Omaha and Utah Beach. After that was done, he came back into the 9th Armored Division, fought brilliantly in the bulge, took the Ramagan Bridge. Both he and Clark commanded the I, I Corps in 8th, 8th Army in the Korean War, Clark and then Hogue. Both commanded 7th Army. Uh, Bill Hogue uh, lived in a trailer house out here in Easton, Kansas, just west of Lansing, and, uh, and finally uh, died in, uh, at Munson Army Hospital. And uh, Hogue Hall, the, the BOQ here for TDY folks, now Holiday Inn, uh, was named for Bill Hogue. Great soldier. I wish more people knew about him. I'd love to write a biography, but there's just not enough record of him. And I'm sorry for taking so long to answer that question. Oh, no. Uh, next question is from uh, someone who wishes uh, we don't know who he is or she is. Uh, if the Germans have so many horse-driven forces, how did they maintain the numbers during the war? Uh, the number, how did they get remounts? Yeah. Well, they, they got remounts uh, because one of the things the Germans never didn't do until pretty late in the war is fully mobilize. 
So the notion of Blitzkrieg and all of that, there's a lot of mythology associated with that. And there's a book uh, written by the German official history uh, folks called Blitzkrieg Legend, uh, I'm sorry, Blitzkrieg Legend, written by a man named Frieser, F-R-I-E-S-E-R, -E -E which is worth reading that talks about some of that. But the remounts came from uh, uh, all over Germany, all over Prussia, which was big horse country, and Central Europe. I haven't made a study of that, so I could be, uh, I could be uh, mistaken about uh, the precise locations, but primarily from uh, Eastern Germany and Prussia, over. Uh, question, during the bulge, um, units were reassigned. You, you, you know, you saw some attached back up to uh, Montgomery's uh, army. Uh, how did that affect uh, command and control with this, as far as with the division that you're looking at, the seventh? Well, the 7th Armed Division um, on the 16th of December was getting ready to participate in a, uh, an attack on the Ruhr River, R-O-E-R, -E there's two of them there that sound the same, versus the R-H-U-R farther east. They were going to do that as part of 9th Army. They were immediately sent south, as was the 10th Armored Division sent north out of 3rd Army. And the reason for that is because there was no... Uh, theater reserve. The only units that could be called on, uh, allegedly called on as a reserve, were the 82nd, 101st, they were recovering from Operation Market Garden. So the 9th Army, uh, uh, the ninth Army, the 1st Army, and the 3rd Army were in 12th Army Group. So they were all within the same Army Group, Bradley's Army Group. What happened, though, was because of the penetration, the ability to communicate from Bradley's headquarters to the northern side of the penetration was limited. So Eisenhower quite properly gave command of everybody in the northern shoulder of the penetration to 21st Army Group led by uh, uh, Montgomery, uh, Bernard Law Montgomery, who commanded 21st Army Group. As an aside, the only guy that understood the seriousness of the penetration on the evening of the 16th of December was Dwight D. Eisenhower. At six o'clock that night, and Versailles, where he was having a meeting with Bradley and others on trying to figure out how to solve the shortage of infantry replacements. He's the one that said, okay, this is serious. We're gonna respond as though this was uh, existential, which is when he had uh, cut orders to send an armored division north out of three, third, AD, third Army and seventh AD out of ninth Army and both the uh, 82nd, 101st. Meanwhile, Ridgeway and his corps headquarters were still in the UK, so they ordered uh, Ridgeway and the corps headquarters to come in as well. Over. Uh, this question is from Catherine. She wants to have you discuss U.S. casualties uh, during this uh, campaign uh, based upon the conditions. Well, the, there were, uh, as I recall, and I, had, I, I can look it up in the book, but I, I, I don't want to take a lot of time with roughly 80,000 casualties. And that's a great question because one of the main uh, uh, cause of casualties in the bulge was immersion foot or trench foot, uh, frostbite, and upper respiratory infections. In, in, as in almost all wars, there were more non-battle casualties than there were battle casualties. In this case, cold weather was the main thing. And one of the reasons for that was, I mentioned earlier that we culminated at, at the Siegfried line. Well, we were hauling everything we could uh, with uh, the Red Ball Express. I'm sure everybody's heard about these truck companies that were put on one-way routes to get things forward, but they couldn't bring enough forward. There was just, there was just no way uh, they could get everything forward. So they took risk. And one of the risks they took was in order to haul fuel and ammunition and food, they didn't haul forward winter clothes. So when the, when the snows came, uh, we weren't properly equipped. Uh, some units had it, but, but many did not. And this was one of the coldest winters. Uh, it was the coldest winter in a century. So the temperatures were far colder than normal. Now, anybody that's ever lived in Germany or this part of uh, Europe, uh, it's, like, it's like the Pacific rainforest. It's wet, misty, humid, and because it's as far north as it is, cold. Uh, the average uh, temperature in this, this part of the year is about 40 degrees with uh, eight or nine days freezing temperatures in, in the months of November and December. And uh, they're far enough north where by the, by the end of November and the middle of by winter solstice, you have less than eight hours of sunlight. So it's cold, wet, and even colder and wetter than normal, uh, 
um, that caused a lot of casualties over. Uh, how did this uh, battle casualties compare with, say, others earlier uh, from 1944? Uh, this was the most, this was the biggest battle with the most casualties, arguably, in U.S. history. Now, I have a friend named Roger Cirillo that argues with me about that, says Soissons was worse. Well, it may be so, but there's nothing like this in the U.S. Army in World War II. The largest surrender after that in Bataan, or at Cregador to be precise, was we surrendered two regiments that were cut off in the Chennai Eiffel, the 422nd and the 423rd. And by the way, one of the soldiers in the, uh, in, in that surrendered was a man named Kurt Vonnegut, who described the, uh, the walk into uh, prison camp as a, a river of shame. Vonnegut uh, watched the uh, firebombing of Dresden, which led uh, to uh, his disenchantment with the bombing campaign and a book called Fahrenheit uh, 450 or 451, I forget what it's called, 450, I think it is. Over. Um, this question uh, here is from uh, Ed again. Uh, he's asking about, uh, is it rumor or fact that most of the cold weather gear wound up with the rear echelon troops? Did you see any indications of that in your, your studies? Yes, it's both rumor and fact. I mean, the things were never quite as bad as the rumor mill, but certainly bad enough. Uh, it, every, in every war, I, I suspect since Thucydides wrote about the Peloponnesian Wars, the guys in the rear, you know, get the gear first, the guys forward get it last. You know, uh, it is what it is. I mean, we, we, it's a human institution. Uh, there was there were black market uh, uh, folks operating in the in the rear. Uh, it didn't it didn't help matters that the services of supply commander J C H Lee, uh, who was called Jesus Christ himself Lee by his critics, moved his headquarters and a great many of his troops into Paris. So if you're in a foxhole at 20 degrees and you know three inches of water in the bottom of a foxhole and you know the services of supply troops are in Paris, you're liable to think things are worse than they are. And they were, but the flip side of that is, uh, it, right up until the uh, the campaign started, the 106th Division was eating hot pancakes and, and uh, bacon every morning. Uh, everybody in uh, in the Hurtgen Forest on Thanksgiving Day, virtually everyone got hot turkey dinner. The United States Armed Forces in World War II were far better supplied uh, than their opponents, and we had the very best artillery, bar none. And we had a philosophy as send a pro Joe so Joe don't go. And the third day of, uh, of the fighting in uh, the Bulge, the 8th Corps, the Corps that had the 106th Division, the 7th Armed Division, had 55 artillery battalions shooting for it. And if you've never been shelled, then you can't appreciate how valuable artillery is. Artillery is, was the big killer and the big, uh, a big means to... Uh, uh, save lives for the U.S. forces over. Uh, this question is from Joe, and I, I don't know when you began your research on this, uh, this unit, but did you apply any of the things you learned from your, your research when you commanded uh, the armor battalion during Desert Shield, Desert Storm? I did. I, ha I had the opportunity to teach history at the United States Military Academy, and as a part of that, they sent you to graduate school. So I went to graduate school I got a master's in European history. I had, I had grown up in and around Germany as a, as, as a kid, nine-year-old kid. I read John Toland's Battle, the Story of the Balls. I was fascinated with it from that time. I was born in 49. So, you know, I knew I grew up with people whose dads were, my dad was a soldier. Uh, one of my classmates, Tom Ballou, his father had been uh, one, in the 106, had surrendered and had been in prison. So I knew these people and I was interested in it. I actually began the research when I did my second master's degree when I was in the School of Advanced Military Studies, which is why I got to interview Hasbrook and uh, uh, Clark and a number of their battalion commanders and a number of their soldiers because they were still alive. Uh, they weren't real interested in telling their stories then. And so I couldn't really write a book. I wrote a master's thesis on it. And then I resolved, I, after uh, 28 years in the Army, almost 29, I went to work as a G2 guy at training and doctrine command, despite my armor background, because I was doing threat emulation. And I retired after, uh, in 2013, with the intention of writing books. And so I'm working on my fourth. And the second one I wrote was on, uh, rather, the third one I wrote was on the Battle of Bulge. And I finished a project I'd started in 1984. Over.
Um, this question uh, looks at uh, a question about what actions, I have to find it again. Can you speak about the actions that delayed uh, uh, Piper's units? Well, Piper, uh, one of the problems that Piper had was he had, uh, as I remember, 118 or 20 armored vehicles. And as he went west, he was being preceded by a parachute division. <clears throat> the parachute division was supposed to clear out uh, Route C, or rather D and E. Uh, e ran through what's called the Losheim Gap, or Losheim Gap, and it went due west, just to the south of, uh, of a piece of terrain called the Elsinborn Ridge. And so the problem that he had was he had this very long column. So you figure 116 or 18 armored vehicles, you figure uh, with a 20 uh, with a 50 meter interval, which is what you'd want to do, uh, you do the math. Uh, every vehicle took about 70 meters or so, counting its own length. So you multiply 70 meters times 116. You know that that gets to be a whole bunch of meters. So you had a column that was enormously long and difficult to manage. And it was going down one road largely. In fact, he actually tried to use two roads, but uh, traffic control was a big problem. The first problem was there was an overpass blown uh, out east, uh, right at the Elosheim Gap. So they had to figure out a way, the engineers had to figure out a way to get that fixed. And so once he got back past that, there was a, a, a cavalry and 14th cavalry group that delayed matters in the Losheim Gap, as well as the intelligence and reconnaissance platoon led by a man named Lyle Balk on the southern extremity of the Elsinborn Ridge. And Balk held up the parachute uh, regiment, a lead parachute regiment, the parachute division from about eight or nine in the morning until two or three in the afternoon. So all of those delays cumulatively began to affect them and they started running into the 7th Armed Division as it went south, which is why Malmedy happened. The, uh, the, the unit that was massacred at Malmedy had entered the 7th Armed Division convoy column. It was a core unit, but it was in the, in the column, and it went into Malmedy at the same time as the 1st SS was going west. Farther west, uh, engineer, an engineer battalion, Blue Bridges at Stablo and Trapon, and the uh, 7th Armed Division had a gunfight. Uh, all of these things cumulatively delayed uh, Brother uh, Piper. And then finally, the 30th Infantry Division got an infantry regiment in front of him, stopped him, eventually cut him off, and then uh, destroyed him. About 800 guys got out of the 1st SS on foot. But essentially, because of the delays, and if you look at that uh, sketch again, that uh, the, the vague uh, schizotile ice, you can see those words weren't really good anyway. So there, there was some truth to the idea that the Ardennes was an obstacle over. Okay. Um, question, early in the, uh, the battle, um, the Germans, right after their artillery barrage, used searchlights to illuminate the battlefield. Did our troops, and anywhere did you see com uh, commentary about that use of searchlights? Yeah, what the, what the Germans did is the searchlights, it was overcast. That was one of the reasons that they, they did the attack. And by the way, uh, to, to make sure people understand that this is a lightweight work, Hitler specified uh, that he wanted to do a counteroffensive and he wanted to do it uh, somewhere in, in Belgium in August of 44. By October, they had decided pretty much what the vectors were and they rebuilt units to do it. So one of the other things people need to remember is you don't decide to send a quarter of a million people into a fight you know, overnight. It takes time to get them organized and, and, and do the work to get them there. So uh, uh, timing is, is part of it. And the second uh, piece of that I would say is that and I lost my train of thought again, Mike. What's the rest of the question? The question dealt with the use of German use of searchlights. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm an old guy and I make these kind of mistakes now. So they, they shine the searchlights on the bottoms of the clouds and that gave indirect illumination. And they had lots and lots of searchlights, so that worked. They also uh, had about a thousand guns uh, working with them too. So they could also shoot flares. The other thing that they did, because they weren't well trained, and the Germans had a fundamentally different idea than we did about this, is that it was easier to attack at night with untrained troops. We thought it was far more difficult. They had to have highly trained, specialized troops do that. Not true. 
1st Infantry Division, 104th Infantry Division made a habit of doing it. But the Germans did it too. And the way they would do that, you get somebody that knew you know, how to lead uh, the troops and they would lead their way and infiltrate into the enemy positions. And that's what they did to the 106th Division is they attacked at night with not particularly well-trained troops, but led by people that knew what they were doing. Right. And I see you have the chart up now that shows Savith after the battle. Uh, yeah. You can see it's pretty well beat up. The trees that you see there are the Prümerberg, and you saw a picture that was taken of the Prümerberg in a summer day. And uh, sorry for getting, you know, segueing off of that, but that hopefully answered the question that was asked. Uh, last question, and then I'll have, uh, I have two comments that folks wanted to, well, three comments that people wanted to pass. One, uh, this is from Lee. He was asking about the 14th Cavalry Group. Was it OpCon to the 106th Infantry Division? And why did such a light formation, uh, why was it given responsibility for securing the Losheim Gap? Yeah, that's a great question. The 14th Cavalry Group uh, had two cavalry squadrons in it, uh, the 18th and the 32nd. These were both very light units. Uh, they were commanded by a man named Divine, Mark Divine. Uh, the two squadrons were in an economy of force role, which is uh, code for we don't have enough troops, so we're going to put somebody out there and spread them out. Uh, they only had one squadron forward. Uh, the 18th was forward. The 32nd was back, it had all the engines out of its tanks. It was doing maintenance, trying to get ready. To their credit, they got back into the fight uh, all in the same day. Uh, some bad things happened to them. Um, my own view is, uh, and my focus of my story was not the 106th Division, it was the 7th Arm Division. My own view is uh, General Allen Jones, commander of the 106th, uh, inherited a really bad situation that he did not make better uh, because he was he was making some kind of bad decisions. He also was not helped for the first 48 hours for reasons I've never understood. Troy Middleton was not on his game. Troy Middleton was a great corps commander. He was commander of the 8th Corps. And, and he, did not, he did not communicate clearly with Jones. So back to the 14th Cav, with only one Cav squadron, they were there to do a security mission. That is, hey, their bad guys are coming. And then presumably others would react. The bottom line up front is they weren't up to that task. It was, they were too small to do it. Uh, the 8th Corps knew it and put them there anyway because Bradley had decided to take a risk. And the reason he took the risk is in order for us to maintain the pressure on the Germans, we had to keep attacking. You can't do that without troops. The only way you could generate troops was to take them from one place and thin out the lines. And so the line uh, in the bulge was 80 miles wide for the 8th Corps. It had just a little bit more than three divisions. And the infantry division in World War II was believed to be able to defend about 10 miles a line. So you had 80 miles with three divisions. The math is very clear. You had less than half of the divisions you needed to man that front. So it was a risk, a gamble, if you like. And the only guy that appreciated how serious it was on the 16th was Dwight Eisenhower. So whatever criticism you ever heard about Dwight Eisenhower, in my opinion, he deserves the title of great general officer for the decision he made to treat that as a major uh, counteroffensive rather than a counterattack over. Okay, the two, uh, the two comments, one uh, on, on Vonnegut's book, it was Slaughterhouse Five. Slaughterhouse Five, thanks. Fahrenheit 451's about burning the library books, sorry. Yes. Uh, and then uh, uh, Catherine Malena, her, her uncle was actually in this battle and, and was one of those frostbite casualties, was, was motivation for her, her question. And then uh, a, a comment from uh, John, who must know you well. He says, uh, be sure to interview uh, General Paul Gorman before he dies. He's 93, he lives in uh, Virginia. His mind is good and he'd have much to share with you about your first infantry division book. I have chatted with Paul Gorman about that book and others, and I've had dinner with him more than once. And he and John is absolutely right. Paul Gorman is, uh, as you can tell, I can't remember what the questions are. Paul Gorman knows exactly what's going on at all times. But what a brilliant officer. He wrote a book for those that are, uh, that are interested, or rather a study on future victories based on analysis of the fighting in World War II. And if you think about the Army being confronted potentially with uh, conventional operations today, there's still things to be learned from the Second World War. Over. Well, I want to thank uh, everyone who joined us. Uh, Greg, I want to thank you for coming on tonight and, and discussing this topic. Uh, do you have any closing comments? I would just like to say uh, in, in the time that we had, I, I went through a lot of material. 
whether you read my book or another. I hope folks will take the time to read about the Siegfried Lion campaign and the Battle of the Bulge. It is, in my opinion, uh, as important as Gettysburg in the history of the United States Army to understand what that fight was like and to take the time to look at the institutional decisions because things that were done in the National Defense Act of 1920 mattered still in 44 or 45. The 1947 uh, National Defense Act, so-called Unification of the Armed Forces, still matters today. Strategic decisions last a long time, so we don't want to make mistakes if we can avoid them over. Um, do you mind, uh, you, you indicated sharing your email. Do you mind yes. sharing your email on when we post this on YouTube? Please do. I'm happy to answer questions, and uh, better personal attacks are welcome as well. Uh, ad hominem comments are okay. Uh, I, I, I want people to read and study our history. I think it's important. And, and thank you very much for having me tonight. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure. Uh, for those who joined us, again, thank you. Glad you came back uh, uh, to the program on the new year. I'd invite everyone to come back on the uh, 19th of January. We're going to jump back another, dec uh, another century. Uh, we have Dr. P uh, Peter Carmichael, who's going to look at the motivation of Civil War soldiers, both North and South to serve, what, what brought them to the battlefield, how did they react to the stresses of, of combat and the boredom of being a soldier? So it should be an interesting conversation on, at 7 p.m. on the 19th of April. So thank you much. Greg, again, thank you. Anything I can do for you out here at the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center, please let me know. Yeah, uh, uh, happy to do that. As you know, I've already asked for a couple of favors and tell Paul Pardue, I saw his note and tell him to send me an email so I know where he is. Okay, and then you, uh, for those who aren't familiar with us, uh, the youth, the foundation is the Friends Group for the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center. Uh, the center is the Army's premier archival and research facility uh, with an outstanding library and unmatched manuscript collection. So please, if you've never visited, come and uh, visit, not only to do research, but to look at the museum exhibits they got that focus on the American soldier. So again, thank you much all night. Again, thank you, Greg, and we look forward to talking to you in the next couple of days, and hopefully I can find something uh, to help you with that, uh, that research. Thank you, sir. Okay, good night. Night.